Anishutes, Chapter 12. The MPs who had caught me had seen a sliver of light coming from the basement window I had failed to block out completely. Without arresting me formally, they took me to my first sergeant's office where I stood before him, still wearing the robe of Dr. Holtz. He ordered me to take it off, and then asked what I was doing down there. I can't sleep at night sometimes, so I go down there and clean, I said straight-faced. He scrunched up his nose and gave me a long, hard look. This was his, are you lying to me, look. I almost got it squared away, I added, thinking about how much work I'd put into it. Finally, he sighed and opened a can of dip. Look, I have guys being sent back from Gosney with positive urinalysis. I have guys who are stealing stuff, and a few were pretty sure who were bringing in drugs from the check. Do you understand? He asked as he hooked a wad of tobacco and packed it into his mouth. Yes, for Sergeant. I lied. We got all kinds of things for you to clean come daylight, he mumbled around the wad of chaw. They're telling me you should be charged for trespassing because MPs don't have anything better to do. But if you tell me you're never going to go back down there again, I can look the other way and do more important stuff. Roger, First Sergeant, I said. You hear me? I do, First Sergeant. If I can just get this done, he tapped the pointer finger on a manila folder. I can see that Jeffries finally does some time for someone's Xanax, he said, half to himself. So I avoided all kinds of legal proceedings to add to my misery due to basic army laziness. First Sergeant did order me to go to the shrink, though. Do you still see them? The shrink asked a few days later when an appointment had come open. I nodded. Right now? she asked. There's one right there, I said, pointing to Jens, the de facto OBGYN who sometimes followed me around. What's he doing? she asked. He was staring at her old lady boobs. He's just chilling, I said. Have you been back to the basement since your incident with the MPs? she asked. No. I answered honestly. I wanted it all to stop, but it wouldn't. How I felt about Anna, the memories of what had happened in the basement, and the continued relentless visits from the dead. I saw them staring at me from the corners of my room as I tried to sleep. Their eyes were angry now. Even the less malevolent hauntings still terrified me at the prospect of falling back into another world. I would be eating in the chow hall when some young Wehrmacht lieutenant would saddle up to me and jabber away enthusiastically as we ate. I would slowly roll my food around in my mouth, trying my best to savor chow hall stir-fry and remember that it was not supposed to taste like schnitzel or bratwurst or anything else I'd eaten with the dead. Twice I saw the acne-scarred Dura walk through the wall into my room and stare at me as I tried to play video games. Ironically, he usually did it when I played zombie Nazis. Maybe it had always been like this, even before I could see them. Had they wandered around, all of us, sitting with us as we ate and watched us sleep? I was just the lucky guy who saw them now because of what I had gotten into. Some would appear as just a pair of glowering red eyes beneath the slits of the stairs on the fire escape. Once I woke up to have one pinning me by my throat to the mattress and gnashing broken yellow teeth in my face. The next gunnery range was less than a week away. Because that was a really short chapter, we're actually just going to go ahead and skip to Anna Schutz, chapter 13. Three days before the gun range, I was sent to Specialist Jenkins' barracks room. Private Jeffries, Specialist Springsteen, and I stared at the puddle of yellow on his floor. Dude, Jeffrey mumbled softly under his breath. All of Drab 550 cords had been braided into a thin rope that hung from one of the exposed rafters. It was frayed and spread at loose ends where it had been cut. The splayed ends hanging high above the yellow puddle. There was a near reverence to the room, an anticipatory stillness. Is that? Jeffries asked. P? I nodded in the quiet space. Why did we get stuck with this? He whined, his voice becoming thin and reedy, betraying the fact that he was shaken by what he saw. Because we're here, I said quietly. I breached the doorway slowly, my gaze fixed on the strands above my head. I walked around them in a little circle, unable to take my eyes off them. They spoke to me. They reminded me that even if I didn't have Anna anymore, even if I didn't have my job in the basement anymore, even if all I had left were years of servitude and the angry red-eyed harbingers that glared at me with almost every turn, there was still a way out. At least I would have a shore to swim to and throw myself onto like a grateful and exhausted castaway. The other guys stood there in the doorway for a while, not wanting to enter a room touched by something that unnerving. For me, though... I could feel the cold and familiar seductive fingertips down my neck and spine. Eventually they breached the threshold, dragging the mop and bucket we had been told to fetch. It looked like all the other barracks rooms, a centerfold tacked to the wall, a giant TV plugged into a voltage adapter. But it was different now, visited by what they would soon label a tragedy. 
Jeffries began to thumb through the green cases of Xbox games along the wall. Don't take his stuff, I said to Jeffries quietly. I'm not, he said. He has a kid back in the States, I lied. He does? I nodded. He rested its greedy hands on his thighs, but continued to prowl. Specialist Jenkins, the walking dead, the scarecrow, the one that nobody noticed unless they needed into the arms room, had finally made up his mind. While I had hidden a bullet remotely out in the woods, counting the days until I might use it, Jenkins had been a man of action. I wondered what his face had looked like as he sat on the bed, braiding the 550 cord into a usable slip knot. Sad. Determined. Crying. Probably just blank. His desk chair lay on its side by the pool of urine. I could see it in my mind, Jenkins in his uniform carefully teetering over the flimsy government chair. Perhaps he spread his hands out to the open air for a moment to catch his balance before threading the homemade rope through the exposed rafter. Then he poked his head through the knot. Perhaps it was a fantasy he had premeditated for who knew how long on cold fall nights, maybe all through the preceding summer. I pictured him standing there quietly with his eyes closed atop the chair like a man in prayer. Finally, he took a deep breath and lurched off the chair out into thin air. His body came crashing down, pulling the cord taut. He swung to the side, kicking the chair over. I hadn't considered the pain, the horrible feeling of being cut off from oxygen by a tightening grip around a windpipe, the twitching of feet, the writhing of his spine. Artifacts of Jenkins' suicide, their raw, cold ominousness should have scared me, but I looked on them like a tourniquet or an inoculator syringe. They were a necessary means to an end, just like my rifle would be. Just a few more days. A nervous and jittery lieutenant had set us in to clean up, saying that it was a real mess. However, aside from the urine and turned over chair, it was clinically squared away. I noticed Springsteen was staring up at the frayed ends of the rope, too, with an oddly sober expression. Was he contemplating the same thing? I set the chair back on its feet, figuring the MPs or whoever it was that dealt with these kind of things were done with their investigation if we were sent in to clean it up. I defied every urge to climb above the chair and let the frayed ends of the rope play against the nape of my neck just to see what it felt like. Sergeant Andrews was the one who initially found him. We saw the NCO afterwards in the chow hall staring at his biscuits and gravy looking white as a sheet. I stared at the frayed ends of the homemade noose and imagined Sergeant Andrews' flick knife he always carried, frantically sawing through the threads after Jenkins had failed to report to morning formation. I wondered if Andrews felt bad about teasing Jenkins as he cradled the boy down to the tile floor and frantically tried to jerk the cord free before breathing into the dead kid's mouth. I walked around the room, figuring that everything in it, the DVDs, the TV, the books, the games would be coated with a nice layer of dust accumulating since whenever Jenkins had given up on using them and everything else in his life. Jeffries was touching Jenkins' video games again as Springsteen began to mop up the pee. I knew Jenkins' stuff would be pillaged. Video games, DVDs, pornography, clean socks, ranks and hats and insignia until a slightly trunicated but sterilized version of his goods were sent home. I wondered who he had listed at 18 years old as his next of kin on an SGLI life insurance policy. I thought about taking a souvenir for myself, nothing of value, perhaps one of his razors or a box of dental floss. I could use them while I stared into the bathroom mirror and asked what it was that gave Jenkins the courage to do what I had failed to do thus far. I was surprised when I saw it. It was like a mirage, something a little too good to be true, something there was no way I was seeing. It was better than a souvenir. A plastic key card like what they gave you in hotels lay on his desk next to a blank legal pad. I'd seen Jenkins bleary-eyed in his pajamas carry it to the arms room before and, and slide it into the magic slot when we'd been called up in the middle of the night to do a security detail and needed weapons. He kept it on him all the time, but maybe he had been too depressed or so uncaring he'd left it out like that, or maybe he'd done it on purpose for the next armorer to get a hold of. The truth is, he probably just didn't care. Feeding, chambering, locking, cocking firing. It was so simple. All right there before me. No more anxious wanting and waiting and wondering if I could do it. I slid a hand out discreetly, feeling the cold plastic under my palm, and walked out of the room, not bothering to make sure nothing was stolen or left a mess. A Reich there, a soldier peered from around one of the doorways of a community bathroom as I walked towards the main exit. He held a straight razor in one hand. His face was half covered in shaving cream. He had on a white undershirt, and his suspenders dangled around the knees of his gray wool trousers. He broke a malevolent grin from his half-shaving cream-covered face, and followed me with his eyes as I walked by, 
I stopped in the middle of the hall and pivoted to face him. He eyeballed me condescendingly, and I stared at him until a mean tooth grin slowly spread over my face. We glared at each other for a while. I clicked my heels together and raised my hand in a fascist salute, key card jutting from the tip of my fingers. Bis später, I said coldly. I just wanted to thank you for listening. I hope that you like the story. Right now, this podcast is available on YouTube. It's available on Podbean, Stitcher, and iTunes. So if you're not already listening to the story in your preferred format, please look at the links below and find what you need. If you go onto Facebook and do a search for Keystrokes Amid Cobwebs, you can find our Facebook page and learn more about the show and also potential future shows. So please get on there so we can become friends. And finally, I'm really looking for feedback. Do you like the story? Do you hate it? What are some things you enjoyed or things you would change? Um, if you can, please give me an email at keystrokesamidthecobwebs at gmail.com. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you.